I welcome you to our worship service today. And I pray that the Lord will bless you and make you a channel of blessing unto all people around you. And that great things will happen in your life and through your life everywhere you find yourself in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. We glorify you because of who you are. We thank you because you are doing a great thing in every life. In our lives too, we know you are going to continue to do great and wonderful and mighty things in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that today your word will enlighten everyone. Your word will stir up everyone. And your word will make us to do purposeful work for you in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And then in verse 36, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Then it continues. We come to verse 40. And Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, and he was confirming the churches. Those are the words we're looking at today, and it gives us the importance of evangelism, the importance of discipleship, and the importance of follow-up. As you look at the work of the Lord, in our hands. He's told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And as we preach the gospel, we bring men and women, boys and girls, and people in our communities. We bring them to repentance. And as they repent, they believe of the Lord Jesus Christ. A change takes place in their lives. You understand? You know this. If any man be in Christ, they come to Christ now. They are converts, they are babes in Christ. And if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. But we need to nurture the baby. We need to develop the new convert. And we need to enlighten them and help them to understand how they can grow in the Lord, how they can read the Word, how they can have fellowship with the Lord, how they can also become profitable and useful in the kingdom of God. That's why as we look at this passage today, we're looking at uh, the topic, Rewardable Faithfulness in Productive Evangelism. Understand that? Not just evangelism. Evangelism that is productive. Evangelism that leads to people getting converted coming into the kingdom, living in the kingdom, living by the grace of God, and living in, in godliness in the word of the Lord, and getting ready and prepared for the coming of the Lord. Rewardable faithfulness in productive evangelism. Productive evangelism, productive soul winning, productive follow-up, productive discipleship, demand a lot of things. Number one, it demands the right passion. The right passion. We have to be passionate. We have to be concerned. We have to know that the people need us. They need the gospel. Those who are in darkness, they need the light. And we must be passionate about it. Number one, then, is the right passion. Number two, renewed priority. As we, we are Christians and children of God, there are times we lose our priority. There are times we do not have the right perspective. But if we're going to do the work of soul winning well, and the work of what very well, 
and the work of discipleship very well, we must have a renewed priority. Number three, we must have relentless pursuit. We are pursuing the work. We are pursuing the assignment the Lord has given us. We are pursuing the fulfillment of this great commission. The relentless pursuit and refreshed personnel. One person cannot do it. It takes a lot of people, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, Titus, everyone. But those personnel, the people in the personnel, must be refreshed. Refreshed in their soul. Refreshed in their mind. Refreshed in their spirit. Refreshed in every area of their life. So that they go in the freshness of the spirit of God. In the freshness of their experience with the Lord. So that the work will be done properly. And the people they reach out to. And the people they are ministering to as individuals. As families. As neighbors, they will see the freshness of the Spirit of God upon them. What am I saying and what the scriptures say we ought to have? If we're going to do the work of evangelism and discipleship appropriately, a right passion, a renewed priority, reliable, a relentless uh, pursuit, refreshed personnel, reliable partnership, reliable partnership. The people who come together, the people who join together, and they partner in the work of the Lord, like Paul and Silas, like Paul and Barnabas, like John and Peter, like James and other people, as the Lord sent them out to by two. And they go out in partnership like that, doing the work of the Lord, calling men to repentance and redemption and righteousness. There must be reliable partnership and then righteous precaution. As you go out, you are precaution, you are careful, you are courteous, and you are looking at the people and you are relating with the people in the normal way, in the appropriate way, so that the work, the word, will come out from you and come out from your team in a unified form, in a convincing manner, and they're able to actually receive the word that God is helping you to give them. And then finally, there shall be a rising perseverance. Changes and difficulties will be there. It will appear that, you know, maybe the road is rougher than before. Maybe the situation is more critical than before. But then our perseverance must be rising with the challenge of the day. Understand then, as we're looking at this, and this is not just for you to have something in the head or something in the mind. You must have this in your own heart and understand, I must have a right passion. I must have a renewed priority. I must have relentless pursuit. I must have re a refreshed or refreshing personnel, reliable partnership, righteous precaution, and rising perseverance. And actually, this work the Lord has given us demands uh, a kind of uh, earnestness from us. And we do it daily every day, at every opportunity. We do it willingly. We do it joyfully. We do it cheerfully. And we do it persuasively. We're persuading the people. We're telling them to turn away from darkness and turn to the light. And we do it persuasively. We do it prayerfully. We are also doing it lovingly. And we're doing it wisely. You do it at every opportunity. You do it in season. And you do it out of season. You will do it. I will do it. We're talking today on rewardable faithfulness in productive evangelism. Three things we're looking at as we look at the passage before us. Number one, the teaching and the preaching of the word. The teaching and the preaching of the word. Evangelism demands the word. Salvation demands the word. Faith in Christ demands the word. The gospel must be presented unto the people we're reaching out to. And so that means there's going to be the preaching of the word. There's going to be the teaching of the word. Point number one, the teaching and preaching of the word. Point number two, 
the task and pursuit of the wise. Think about a person who plans for the future. Think about a person who is planning for a rewardable service in the future. He has a task. You know, we will not be wise if we abandon the work he has given us to do. If we, if we shirk our responsibility, we will not be wise if we will not teach the people, preach to the people, and give the gospel to everyone. We will not be wise if we are not obedient to the heavenly vision and to the preaching of the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ had said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And the wise believer and the wise disciple and the wise member of the body of Christ and the wise minister and the wise servant of God will do exactly what the Lord has said. That what shows our, our wisdom. Who is the wise servant? faithful servant among the people, then you will feed the people with the word of God and do the work the Lord has given us to do. Point number two, the task and the pursuit of the wise. Point number three now, teaming up together for the progress of the work. Teaming up together for the progress of the work, of his work, of his work of evangelism of his work in building the body, of his work in bringing people into the kingdom, of his work in making people abide and remain steadfast in the kingdom of God. Let's come to point number one. We're looking at Acts chapter 15. We're looking at verse 35. And Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching. You see that? Teaching and preaching. They remained in the church. They were part of the church. They were ministers in the church. And it says they were teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And let's come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 42. Acts chapter 5. We're reading from verse 42. And I want you to notice those two words again. Teaching and preaching, teaching and preaching. Acts chapter 5, verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every place, every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. What were they preaching? What were they preaching? Jesus the Savior. What were they preaching? Jesus as sufficiency. What were they preaching? Jesus our substitute. What were they preaching? Jesus, our sanctifier. What, had, what were they preaching? Jesus, the power of God in man. And then it says they were doing that daily. And they were doing that from house to house, in every house. And they were teaching and uh, preaching. In fact, as we come to the end of the Acts of the Apostles, that continued, that continued whether it's Paul or whether it's another person, and you now, it's now your turn, that this is what we're to keep doing, whether it's in a private house, in a community, in a church gathering, anywhere the opportunity is, we're teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Come to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28. And I'm reading from verse 30 and verse 31. Acts chapter 28, verse 30. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching. You see those two words again, preaching and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. Teaching with all confidence. If you are preaching to a sinner and you are not confident about what you are saying, if you are teaching a new convert and you are not sure about what you are saying and you are not confident, how will they receive the word? But Paul the apostle and any of the other apostles and any of the other preachers that the Lord has given us as ministers and mentors in the word of God, they taught. They preached, 
with all confidence, no man forbidding him. As I look at this, the teaching and the preaching of the word. There are three things I'm looking at here. Number one, purposeful teaching. Purposeful teaching. Number two, persuasive preaching. Persuasive preaching. Number three, personal participation. Personal participation. Let's look at number one, purposeful teaching. Why are we teaching? What's the purpose of teaching? What's your own purpose? When you go to your neighbor, when you get to somebody that you are talking to and sharing the gospel with, what is the purpose? The purpose is to bring Christ unto them. The purpose is to make them understand there's no other name given under heaven by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus. The purpose is to make them see that they are in darkness, that they are in sin, and they need to come to the Lord, come out of sin, come out of darkness, and come to the only one who can save them. The purpose is to show them the might of the Lord, the word of the Lord, that will get them into action, purposeful action, repenting, repenting of their sin, so that they can have the salvation of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. You see the purpose now? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo I am with you always always even unto the edge of the world give me an amen there amen the Lord Jesus said they should go and teach everyone in the world that means every neighbor that means everyone in your community that means everyone in every house that means we map out all the streets, the whole community. And then if we're going to obey the Lord intelligently, if we're going to obey the Lord strategically, if we're going to obey the Lord systematically, if we're going to obey the Lord profitably, then we go to all those streets and we go to all those houses and we go to all those communities and we're teaching them from the foundation of repentance to all the principles of the Christian living, what the life of a real believer ought to be, and what the grace of God ought to do in their lives, and then teaching them to observe, teaching them to observe all things, all things. We don't miss out anything, you know, but everything the Lord has commanded, everything the Lord has done, what he did on the cross of Calvary, and the result of his sacrifice on our personal lives. That's what we'll teach them whatsoever I have commanded you. And it says, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. When we teach like that purposefully, when we teach like that passionately, when we teach like that profitably, what's going to be the result in the lives and the hearts of the people that hear that purposeful teaching? And they come to the experience of salvation. They turn away from their sins. Don't be happy just because you went out and you talked to somebody and you spoke about the Lord Jesus Christ and you shared the gospel. But our joy comes. When the joy of salvation comes to their hearts and there is joy in heaven because they have repented, come to Titus chapter 2. In Titus chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. It's our teaching the word that makes that grace appear unto them. It's our sharing the gospel, the good news that makes that grace appear unto them. That salvation appear to them. Look at this in verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, 
righteously and godly in this present world. That's the purpose of teaching. We're teaching so that people come to the experience of salvation. We're teaching so that as they come to the experience of salvation, they deny ungodliness. They get away from worldly laws and they live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world. And let's look at um, Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 28, purposeful teaching. In verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man, uh, it says, in all wisdom, as we teach, we are wise in our presentation. It says, we're teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The babe is not perfect yet. The new convert is not perfect yet. It's not perfect in knowledge. It's not perfect in understanding. It's not perfect in character. It's not perfect in the grace of God. It's not perfect in overcoming temptation. It's not perfect in many areas. And we're teaching purposefully to help them, to assist them, so that we can be of help to them, for them to know how to go on day after day and week after week and month after month to come to perfection. It says, whom we preach, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ mentioned in the earlier verse, and warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Number two here is persuasive preaching. Persuasive preaching. As we preach the gospel, as we declare the gospel, as we share the gospel, as we witness to the unbelievers, we do it so persuasively. They don't have any excuse and they don't have anything that they can say, but how about this, how about this? We are, by the grace of God, able to answer all those questions. And the word persuasion comes to the fore, comes to the front. Because now we are preaching persuasively. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 19, we're reading from verse 8. And he went into the synagogue. And speak boldly by the space for the space of three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. That's how Paul did it. That's how all the apostles did it. That's how all the believers in the New Testament did it. That's how they preached. And that is how we are to preach persuasively. You are systematic about it. You go from this to this to this so that they know they're persuaded. There's no other way but this and there is no other path but this and there is no other thing to do but to repent. If they go into a peace with God, if they go into have a position, a place with God in eternity, there must be repentance. There must be faith in Christ. They are persuaded about that. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 of this same chapter, it says, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Isn't that wonderful? That the word of God continued to spread, continued to be preached, and they were doing it persuasively. In fact, we're told, look at verse 20. In verse 20, it says so, Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Even at this time, even at this time of not being able to congregate together in large, in large places, large auditoriums, but you know, we can still present the word 
the, 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 the houses are open and your neighbors are available. Very near you there, you can touch somebody's life. Even on phone, you can touch somebody's life. Instead of, you know, talking about this and talking about that and talking about this other thing, the gospel, the word of God that we're talking about and we speak persuasively so that in every community, so that in every local government, so that all through the region, all through the state, and in the whole country and every country, so mightily grow the word of God and prevail. I want you to look at, you know, what even an outsider, even an unbeliever, even a sinner said about the word that was preached. Look at verse 26 of that uh, chapter. It says, moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people saying that they be no gods which have made with hands. That's a sinner complaining. That's an idol worshiper complaining. And he said, we have followed him. We have seen what he's doing. This Paul the Apostle, almost in all Asia, everywhere we're getting the report that he's persuading people that idols are nothing. Idols cannot save. Paths of darkness cannot save. That the future is bleak and the future is black and the future is going to be of condemnation if they continued in idolatry. And he said something. He said, this Paul persuaded all men. That word persuasion, very important in our sharing the gospel, in our preaching the word. Now you preach the word. Can you say you are persuasive? Can you say the people understand? Can you say the people accept what you are preaching? If you are persuasive and they are persuaded, they will accept. And I pray that God will give us the grace and the wisdom to be more persuasive in what we are preaching and teaching in Jesus' name. You will be more persuasive. And you will be more convincing. And you will teach and preach the word of God, not leaving any shadow of doubt in the minds of the people in Jesus' name. We're coming to Acts chapter 28, and I'm reading from verse 23. Acts chapter 28, verse 23. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. He expounded and testified the kingdom of God. Look at the word that follows here. Persuading them concerning Jesus. Persuading them. They were unbelievers. They were traditionalists. They were religious people. They were Jewish people. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't have the Lord. They didn't know the way of salvation. And Paul the Apostle invited them. You can invite people. Not only that you can invite people. People can. You can also go to them. Even if they are not inviting you. And you expound the word of God. And you explain the gospel of the Lord. And you add your testimony to you. He testified concerning the kingdom of God. Persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses, that's the word of God, and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Paul was really committed to that. And you and I should be really committed to that. And some believed the things which were spoken. Some believed the things which were spoken. I pray you also speak that people will believe the words that you are preaching in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade me because we are concerned and we know the end of the sinner if he doesn't repent before death. And we know where the sinner 
unrepentant sinner who dies in sin where he will spend eternity because we know the terror of the Lord. We know the judgment coming after death. We know the condemnation that will come upon unrepentant sinners. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men but who are made manifest unto God and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Number one there is purposeful teaching. Number two is persuasive preaching. Number three is personal participation. Personal participation. This is not a work we leave only to the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers. This is a work that every member of the church Everyone who names the name of Christ, everyone who says he's born again, everyone who is a child of God, must participate in. Look at Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Personal participation. You are born again, then declare the word. You have the joy of salvation, then declare the word of salvation. I've got it, I've come to introduce something to you. It turned my life around. It transformed my character. And it gives me hope of heaven. It gives me joy, the joy of the Lord. And since that time that I became saved, Things have been totally different in my life. And you're introducing others and you're telling others. We're looking at Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 12. Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Personal me. Restore unto me. And that's a prayer every, everyone can pray. If there's no joy of salvation, if there's no assurance of salvation, if there is no strength in the heart, and there is no stability in the soul, that's a prayer you can pray. I want the joy. I want the happiness. I want the evidence of the salvation of the Lord. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. The spirit of God that you give to everyone freely. The grace of God that you give to everyone freely. Give that to me. And then he said in verse 13, Then after having that joy of salvation, that assurance of salvation, that strength of salvation, after experiencing that grace of salvation, then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Personal, personal. I'll get involved personally. You cannot have the joy of salvation and then just keep quiet. You'll share it with the people you love. You'll share it with the people that need to know. In fact, that's what Christ commanded in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, reading from verse 38. This man experienced the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. The favor of God. The deliverance of the Lord. And see what the Lord commanded him. Uh, that Don't say Peter is doing it. John is doing it. James is doing it. All those apostles are doing it. There are people around you that Peter or James or John cannot reach. They don't even know them. That the pastor or the overseer cannot reach. They don't even know them. And you are to take the gospel personally unto them. Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 38. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house and show how great things God has done unto thee. Return to your household and show how great things God has done unto thee. In fact, he wants you to preach the gospel. 
He wants you to take that word, the same word that saved you, and the same word that brought you into the kingdom. He wants you to take that to everyone that you are familiar with, a friend, a neighbor, a colleague, anyone, and he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. The man did it so persuasively, and the man did it so confidently, and the man did it so cheerfully, and he did it so willingly, and he did it so effectively that all the people he spoke to, they were waiting for Jesus, that what Jesus had done for him, they wanted Christ to do that for them also. That's how we do it. That's how you are going to do it. And this work will reach out, and this word will reach out, and this gospel will reach out and touch the lives of many people. I come to point number two now. Point number two, the task and the pursuit of the wise. The task and the pursuit of the wise. We're coming to Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and beseech our brethren in every city, see the plan, in every city, see the agenda here, see the strategy, and see the move. Let us go again and beseech our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. And see how they do. Verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they parted, they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. The task and the pursuit of the wise. You can tell that Paul the Apostle and all those apostles, they were wise. They knew that what we ought to do today, we cannot delay until tomorrow. And the salvation and the peace and the protection and the provision of Calvary that ought to come to the sinner today, we cannot, we cannot wait or delay until the following day. And the sustenance and the supply and the sufficiency of, the God, of God's grace that shall come to the people we're preaching to today. We cannot delay until another day. And so Paul the Apostle said, Barnabas, we've been there before. We preach to them. Let us go again and beseech the brethren. In this uh, section, I'm talking about three things. Number one, cooperation for rewardable follow-up. Cooperation for rewardable follow-up. We're cooperating together. We're joining hands together. We're joining our resources together. And we're helping the people so that we can follow up on them. Number two, contention with regrettable falling apart. Contention with regrettable falling apart. Number three, concentration for remarkable fruitfulness. Concentration, what we need to concentrate on, what we need to unite about, what we need to put all our strength, all our energy, everything we've got into, we need to concentrate for a remarkable fruitfulness. Look at number one here. Number one, cooperation for 
a wordable volume. Let's come back to verse 36 there. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again. Notice those words. You might want to underline those words in your Bible. Let us go. Let us go. We cannot sit down here all the time. It's wonderful preaching and teaching in the church at Antioch. It's wonderful enlightening people, counseling people, and uh, developing people, motivating people, interceding for people here in Antioch. But all those other cities are there. Where we had preached the gospel, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city. Antioch is important. All the other cities too are important. The believers in the church and the believers in the house fellowship and the believers in the community, they are very important. But the believers outside are also very important. Let's touch their lives. Let us go and visit them and see how they do. And it says, we're going to where we'll preach the gospel before the word of the Lord and see how they are getting on with the new experience and with the word of God that they have learned. And notice those words. Let us go. Look at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 1. Reading from verse 36. And Simon said, And Simon and they that were that were was in followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go. He said unto them, That's Christ, let us go into the next towns. And we must not be so happy with what is happening in this community. What is happening in this environment? What is happening in this locality? That we forget there are other people too. Other believers too. And other sinners too. That need to hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus said unto them. Let us go into the next towns. That I may preach there also. Preach there also. Teach there also. Evangelize there also. Follow up there also. Disciple there also. Bring the grace of God and the strength of the Lord there also. For therefore came I forth. For therefore came I forth. We must understand that God has raised us up. God has raised you up so that you touch the lives of the people around you. And then the people who are still far away, who have not had, or those who have had, and they need to be stabilized in the watch of the Lord, in the grace of the Lord, that you will go there, that you will touch their lives by all means and in every way. For therefore came I forth. In verse 39, and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Let us go where we'll go. You will go. And we will do the work in a proper way in Jesus' name. In fact, as you have spoken to them and as you are speaking to them now, I believe when the lockdown is over and now we have chance to gather together and to come together in a normal, usual fellowship, gathering, and in all the sanctuaries of the Lord, in every state, in every region, in every locality, you know, all the people you have touched, all the people that you have preached to, they too, they will be saying, let us go, let us go. Look at this in Zechariah chapter 8. Let us go. Zechariah chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 21. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go. When the lockdown is over, 
when the shutdown is over, when the restrictions are over, now we can go. We've been hearing through telephone. We've been hearing it through streaming. We've been hearing it through this avenue and that avenue. And now we want to go and have fellowship with the people of God. They too will say, let us go speedily. To pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord's oppose, and I will go also. There will be willingness in the people. They have had this persuasive word that you spoke to them, and they will say, each one will say, I will go also. Ye many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord's oppose in Jerusalem, at the headquarters, in every local church, and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. In those days, the days are coming. I said the days are coming. And you will soon see it in Jesus' name. This pandemic will soon be over. This shutdown will soon be over. In those days shall it come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all the languages and of all the nations even shall take hold of the skirt of him that said you, that said believer, saying, we will go with you. We will go with you. Keep on doing the work now. Keep on touching their lives now. Keep on bringing the grace of God and the assurance unto them now that, that then at that time they will say, we will go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. We have known. We have seen. We have heard. We have experienced that God is with you. Let's come back to Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 37 now. This is the second part of this section. Contention with regrettable Falling apart. That's what contention always does. Makes people to fall apart. Makes projects to fall apart. Makes progress, program, project. Everything we try to do makes it to fall apart. Makes relationship and friendship to fall apart. That's what contention does. The start is seven. And Barnabas determined to take for them, John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp, and the contention was so serious. And the contention was so pinching between them that they departed asunder one from another. So Barnabas took Mark. So Barnabas, because of the contention, so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Now understand. Barnabas was a gracious man. As you look at his life from Acts chapter 4, Barnabas was a gracious man. Barnabas was a good man. He was the one that introduced Saul of Tarsus after he had a good experience, salvation experience. And the people in Jerusalem were not going to accept him because they suspected he was only pretending. Barnabas was the one that came and said, he preached the word also in Damascus and he received him. Barnabas was a good, a godly man. He was the person that sold everything that he had and he gave that for the progress of the work of God. Barnabas was a, a gifted man. When he was sent to Antioch, he so preached the word that many people for a whole year came together and the believers were called Christians first in Antioch. Barnabas was a man who was also uh, graceful, graceful in character. Uh, Paul, 
or Saul had been uh, in Tarsus. And so Paul, uh, sorry, Barnabas also went there to fish him out and to bring him. He was a man that was also given. He was a God-fearing man. He was a God-honoring man. But we have this unfortunate situation. You know, no matter how gracious we are, how good we are, we still love to be courteous and we still ought to take care so that contention will never come between us and the personnel, between us and the partner, between us and the people who are to do the work of God together. Look at that verse 39 again. And the contention was so sharp between them so that they departed asunder one from the other. So Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. What do we learn from the word of God concerning uh, contention? We're looking at Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 14. Proverbs chapter 17. We're reading from verse 14. The beginning of strife. It's as when one letteth out water. Therefore, leave off contention before it be meddled with. It says, don't you want like to start contention or strife or confusion or conflict? Don't allow it to ever start for any reason. Leave off contention before it be meddled with. The work we're doing is more important than any opinion than any idea. I should not be so opinionated. You should not be so opinionated. The wife, the husband, must not be so op opinionated that we are sticking to our gun. I determine this is the way it will be. And if you don't go my way, if I don't go your way, then we come apart. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. God himself but the declaration of the Holy Ghost brought Barnabas and Saul and Paul together. Separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, for the work wherein, whereunto I have called them. God joined them together. Let no Mark, let no John Mark, let no situation, let no contention put us asunder. Look at Proverbs chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, only by pride comes contention. Only by pride, my idea is superior to yours. Or no, his idea is superior to mine. His opinion is superior to mine. And then I'm so proud of my opinion that brings contention. And Barnabas determined a good man, a godly man, a gracious man, a gifted man, a God-honoring man, a God-fearing man, and yet he allowed his determination to take John Mark, he allowed that to put them asunder. Be very careful and be very watchful. Only by pride comet contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 10. It tells us in verse 10 what our attitude ought to be and what our concentration ought to be. In verse 10, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions, there be no falling apart among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Look at verse 11. For it has been declared unto me of you, Corinthians, of you, brethren, of you, children of God, of you who ought to concentrate on preaching the gospel, on evangelizing, on discipleship, it has been declared unto me of your brethren by them which of the house of Chloe, that there be contentions among you. There be contentions among you. What was their contention? I'm of Paul. 
What was their contention um, of Apollos? What was their contention um, of Barnabas? What was their contention? I am of Christ. Contention. Actually, contention is dangerous anywhere contention is found. Actually, contention is as deadly and contagious as this present ravaging coronavirus. Why do I say that? You see, Barnabas became a victim. As many people become victims of coronavirus, Barnabas became a victim of what I call coronavirus. See, for conflict. He became a victim of the conflict. Oh, of obstinacy. He was obstinate. It must be my way. It must go my way. I determined this is what must happen. That obstinacy then became like a virus that made him to go away from the assignment and the work the Lord had given him are for repudiation. He repudiated the work. He abandoned the work. He left the work the Lord had given him. Oh, obsession. He was so obsessed. John Mark. John Mark, he turned this way, John Mark, where are you? He turned the other way, John Mark, where are you? And that obsession made him to say, I'm obsessed with this. I must have this. I must have this person. If this person is not there, nothing will work. I'm not going to go with Paul the Apostle anymore. That led to negligence. He neglected the work that the, the assignment the Lord had given him, and then apathy. I don't care. The people who are waiting to hear the gospel, I'm not bothered. And the people who are waiting for Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas, they are waiting for us. Uh -uh. I'm so obstinate, I'm obsessed, and I'm going to repudiate everything the Lord has given us to do together. If you don't answer and give in to my obsession, being glory. You know, being glory is like if it, uh, it must go my way. If it doesn't go my way, nothing is going to move. And then indifference, indifference. I don't worry. Doesn't bother me. Barnabas, those people, they need us. And they need the gospel to reach out to them. Let's go. Of these things that you're holding on to, indifference came and then reversion, reversion. He reverted back to his own city. He didn't even stay in the Antioch church. I've been a teacher here. I've been a preacher here. I've been a, a leader here. He didn't even remain there. He was so obsessed and he was so forgetful and he abandoned absenteeism, took over his life. And then you have unfaithfulness and you have self-isolation. Nobody drove him away. Self-isolation. Nobody took the work away from him. Self-isolation. That coronavirus had mastery over Barnabas, a good man, a godly man, a God-fearing man. I pray this will not have the higher, the higher power and the upper hand over your life in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen over there. Conflict will not take over your life. Obstinacy will not take over your life. Repudiation of the work of God will not take over your life. Obsession with an idea, obsession with a person, obsession with an opinion will not take over your life. Negligence will not destroy your life. And then also apathy or absenteeism will not take over your life. Being glory will not take over your life. Indifference will not take over your life. Reversion, going back to, you know, your city and going back to the old denominational church and going back to the old assembly and going back to darkness. All that will not take over your life. Unfaithfulness will not have any part in your life. And self-isolation away from the people of God, away from Paul the Apostle, that the Holy Ghost himself said, separate unto me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work I have for them. Self-isolation, uh, confusion, 
and uh, contention will not take over your life in Jesus' name. Barnabas, unfortunately, left at the Antioch church and he left his evangelistic assignment because of contention. I will not allow contention in my life. Say that for yourself. I will not allow contention in my life. But now, number three here is concentration for a remarkable fruitfulness. Why are we united together? Why are we saying by all means, our heart, our mind, our head, our ideas, everything must keep us together and must concentrate on that. Sanctification, unity brings usefulness. Concentration. Not allowing ourselves to be sundered apart or to be put asunder. That brings fruitfulness. Look at John chapter 17, verse 21. John chapter 17, verse 21. It says that they all may be one. As thou father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. What's the will of God for Barnabas and Paul? That Barnabas and Paul will be one in us. What's the will of God for James and John? That James and John will be one in us. What's the will of God for Peter and John? That Peter and John will be one in us. What's the will of God for the people of God? Evangelists, soul winners, witnesses, those who are preaching the gospel, and those who are raised up to take the word of salvation unto the community, unto the people around us, that every one of us, that they all may be one in us. What's the will of God for the husband and the wife? That they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That the world may believe that thou has sent me. Eventually Paul went out. But you remember, they know Barnabas too. All those cities, all those churches, they know about Barnabas because the first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas had gone. Now Barnabas was there with another person. And they might be asking, Paul, what happened to our preacher? What happened to our praying? What happened to Barnabas? If he told them, they were not able to come to them together because of contention, what discouragement that will be. We must endeavor. I must do everything by the grace of God to remain united for the work's sake, for the soul's sake. For the sake of the people that need to hear the gospel through our combined efforts. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, we need that. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. In the bond of peace, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Come to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, looking at verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and pastored, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, separate me. Barnabas and Saul, Mark was not there. Your Mark was not mentioned. Don't allow what's not, what was not mentioned at the foundation to hinder the progress of the work of God. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Mark chapter 10, we're reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 10, we're reading from verse 9. In Mark chapter 10, verse 9, Watch therefore, God has joined together. Let no man, let no John Mark put asunder. The Lord has called you. The Lord has called me. The Lord has called us to a work, a work of eternal value. 
a war for the saving of souls, a war for the development and discipleship of the brethren. What God has joined together, let no man, let no mark, let no opinion, let no argument, let no contention put asunder. We come to point number three now. And point number three is teaming up together for the progress of his work. Teaming up together for the progress of his work. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 40. Acts chapter 15, verse 40. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren, recommended by the church, recommended by the children of God unto the grace of God. And he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. They went confirming the churches. How did they do that? How did they confirm the churches? Look at chapter 16. Reading from verse 4. And as they went, Paul and Silas, Timothy also joined them now. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which were ordained of the apostles and the elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith, and they increased in number daily. The word of God was now preached, and many people now came to know the Lord, and the people too were established in the Lord. They took the word from the headquarters. They took the word from Jerusalem, and everywhere they went, they declared the same doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, the same word of God, the same preaching, and the same teaching. And the word of God established the people. And Paul and Silas remained faithful. We're coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what we need, the grace of God. That same grace we got in salvation. We need it for sanctification by the grace of God. And then we need it in Holy Ghost baptism by the grace of God. We need each in steadfastness to remain steadfast and stable in the work of the Lord. Whatever the wind, whatever the storm, whatever the circumstance, we need the grace of God. And for the service of God and for the work of the Lord, we need the grace of God. With Barnabas or Silas or Timothy or Titus or with anyone in any region, in every state, in every community, in every home, we need the grace of God to be and to do everything we are called to do. To be and to do everything the Lord has ordained, we will be and do. We need the grace of God and thank God that grace is available, sufficient. That grace is available, sustaining. That grace is available, stabilizing. That grace is available, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored, yes, he did. And yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can labor more than you have ever done, even at this time. You can labor more than you have ever done, even than your earlier years in the Lord, in the ministry. It says, the grace that was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And he wanted that grace of God not only for himself, but for everyone. For you and for me, you'll have more grace in Jesus' name. Abundant grace in Jesus' name. 
sufficient grace in Jesus' name. Stabilizing grace in Jesus' name. Look at uh, verse 58, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the morning, in the night, in the afternoon, in the day, out of season, and in season, at a time of challenge, at a time of difficulties, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, your labor will not be in vain. I said your labor will not be in vain. Let's look at the next chapter, chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 13. Watch it. Stand fast in the pain. Quit you like men. Be strong. Let the grace of God come to you more than ever before. And be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. That's worth love. Look at verse 15. I beseech you, brethren. You know the house of Stephanas. That it is the first fruits of Achaia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You are so addicted to the work of God that John Mark, conflict, contention, strife will not have any part to, in your life to separate you from the work of evangelism, from the work of soul winning, and from the work of follow-up, and from the work of discipleship that you are addicted to the ministry of the saints. That's what God wants of you as a worker, as a minister, as a member. Second Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, were bound together, were joined together, we're tied together. We team up together for the work of the Lord. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. For the people in your community who are not saved, now is the day of salvation for them. For the people who are saved and they are wavering and they are wondering, now is the day of stabilizing establishment for them. For the, for the people who are tempted and they are under some pressure and they need somebody to come, help them, counsel them, uplift them, stabilize them, intercede for them. This is the time. It's a day of salvation. It's a day of strengthening. And it's a day of discipleship. And the Lord wants you to get up and do it, and not wait any other moment. In verse 3, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This is why we're saved. And this is why we're members and ministers in the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 11. And he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? What's the purpose? What's the goal? What are we to do? Why has he raised us up? Why has he raised you up? A brother, a sister, a member, a minister. For what purpose? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the discipleship of the saints, 
for the development of the saints, for the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why we need to prepare ourselves, purge ourselves, purify ourselves, make ourselves ready to be profitable in the kingdom of God, to be profitable in the work of evangelizing and in the work of discipleship, in the work of follow -up, and not allow anything around, anything within to hinder our participation. Second Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor. That's you. I said that's you. You'll be a vessel unto honor. A vessel that brings honor to the Lord. A vessel that brings the gospel to sinners. A vessel that brings strength and grace to the people of God. But it says you have to do something. You purge yourself of strife, of contention, of conflict, of absenteeism, of apathy, of indifference. You purge yourself of anything that may hold you back. If a man therefore purge himself, if his sister therefore purge herself from all these, he shall be, she shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Prepared unto every good work. Second Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort without long suffering. And doctrine, verse 5, watch thou in all things. Watch that contention doesn't come in. Watch that conflict doesn't come in. Watch that being glory doesn't come in. Watch that carelessness doesn't come in. Watch that negligence doesn't take over your life. Watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Your will in Jesus' name. And when the Lord shall come, great will be your reward. He wants you to continue until the very end, until when he will come and will reward his own people. Look at the words of Jesus to you, to me, and to everyone in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. The assignment you have, hold fast till I come. The responsibility you have, hold fast till I come. The calling that you have, hold fast till I come. The occupation and the commitment that you have. And the grace of God that you have. And the privilege of ministering. Of preparing people for heaven and for glory. That you have. Hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh. I will overcome. You will overcome. Each of us will overcome. In Jesus name. He that overcometh and keepeth my works. Not your own works. And keepeth my works. His own work, his own assignment, his own duty, his own responsibility. The great commission he has given unto us, preaching the gospel to every creature and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and keep it my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. Your work will be rewarded in Jesus' name. 
your commitment to what it be rewarded in Jesus' name. Your addiction to the work of God. Your concentration on the work of God. Your unity because of the work of God will be rewarded in Jesus' name. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him, who is that talking about? Thank God is talking about you. Be faithful, be diligent, be committed, be concentrated on this, and be united with the whole church because of this, because of the work he has given us to do. Don't allow your place to be vacant. And don't be missing in this great assignment he has given you, given me, given us to do. And I will give him the money star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He's talking to you. Remain united. Remain committed and remain consecrated for the work of the Lord. The work of the Lord will prosper in your hand. Now you must remember, is there a sinner? You remember their name in their community that the Lord wants you to touch now? Let's go and do that right away. Is there a believer? You have not heard of them. You don't know how they are doing and they need to be steadfast in the faith. You need to establish them in the faith. Do that right away because there's no time to waste so that when the Lord shall come, anytime the Lord will come, he'll find you doing that he has given you to do. And good and honorable and rewardable is that servant whom when the Lord shall come, he'll find so doing. Let's rise up now and commit ourselves and commit the message we've heard and commit our very souls, and commit our very hearts unto the Lord today, that the word will not remain in our heads alone, on our notes alone, but the word will come into our heart, and will mix with every sin and good in our hearts, and will set our feet in motion, will set our mouth talking, and will set our hand reaching out, and will search everything that is in us. Going out, let us go. Going out to the people. And you will do it with all your heart. You'll do it every moment. You'll do it willingly. You'll do it earnestly. You'll do it persuasively. You'll do it prayerfully. You'll do it lovingly. You'll do it wisely. You'll do it persistently at every opportunity. And you'll do it in season and out of season. Open your mouth, tell the Lord, the grace of God is available. That grace made Paul what he was. That grace will make you what you ought to be. And will give you the right passion. The right passion. I feel dull, I feel dead, I feel there's a lot of inertia, I say if I can't rise up, you pray, and the Lord will give you the right passion. Lord, grant me the passion, the passion of a soul winner, the passion of an, of an evangelist, the passion of a preacher that will not rest until I bring that sinner, those sinners, to the Lord, renewed priority in your life, that you will bring this to the fore. You'll bring this to the front burner in your life, that you will have the renewed priority in your life, reaching out to the gospel. Pray, 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 tell the Lord, relentless pursuit, relentless pursuit. You'll pursue, you'll pursue, you'll pursue without ever giving up, the sinners may rebuff you. The sinners may reject you. You not say, well, I've tried my best. I've spoken to them. But they are not yielding. Relentless pursuits. Refreshed personnel. Everyone attached to you. Everyone connected with you. You are reaching out together. 
two brothers together, two prayer partners together, two evangelists together, that you are passionately reaching out together and you are refreshed like personnel, refreshed personnel, and it's a reliable partnership. Paul is planting, Apollos watering, somebody is doing evangelism, the other partner is doing follow up. There is reliable partnership, righteous precaution. You take precaution, you're careful, your heart, your mind, take heed that nothing of your life, nothing of your character will hinder the progress of the work the Lord has committed into your hands. Perseverance. Rising perseverance. The perseverance of today must be greater, must be higher than the perseverance of yesteryears. Rising perseverance. Crusades, when the door is open. Open air evangelism, when the door is open. From house to house, as the opportunity comes, you persevere. So our souls are coming into the kingdom. And your teaching is purposeful. Your preaching is persuasive. Your partnership, participation, personal. And you cooperate for a rewardable follow-up. Cooperate with your leaders for a rewardable follow-up. Cooperate with your partners for a rewardable follow-up. Cooperate with your team for a rewardable follow-up. Don't allow contention to bring regrettable fall apart. Don't allow conflict. Don't allow argument. Don't allow obsession. Don't allow obstinacy. Don't allow vainglory. Don't allow self separation. I separate myself. You can't do that. I isolate myself. You can't do that. I insulate myself. You can't do that. Don't allow anything to stop, to hinder, to halt this great work the Lord has committed into your hand. Concentrate. Unite with the people of God. One heart, one mind, one message, one commitment. One concentration, one unity, together, bound up in the bond of peace, to get the work done. Team up together for progress, not for tearing apart. Team up together for profit, the profit of the work of God. Team up together, and as you do that, seeking the benefit of souls and seeking the growth of believers, great will be your reward in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you today for this worship service. We thank you for your call upon our lives. And we thank you for our response to that call. Thank you, Lord, because we are saved ourselves. We're born again, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, men and women of purpose, men and women of passion, ministers and workers and members of priority. Lord, we pray everything we've seen, everything we've heard, everything we've learned will drop into our heart and be fruitful in our heart in Jesus' name. 
We are asking you, Lord, we will not be selfish with the gospel. We will not be self-centered with the gospel. We will not be limited, limiting ourselves with the gospel. We will reach out and touch the lives of people around us and people beyond us in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, as we touch the lives of sinners, we'll speak persuasively, we'll speak convincingly, and we'll speak so passionately that the people will see this is the way, and they will follow the way, and they will have salvation for their souls in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, we'll not leave the work of discipleship, and the work of preaching and teaching those who are believers already so that they can be established in the faith and established in the grace of God. Lord, we pray that this assignment and duty and responsibility of follow-up, of discipleship, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever you have commanded us, we pray we'll not leave it alone, we'll be addicted to it and established in it in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. As your people go and you give priority to this work of the Lord, seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seeking the expansion of the kingdom of God, we we'll pray that all the needed blessings you add unto every life to you in Jesus' name. We well, thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A good amen. The Lord make you to do the work and make the work to prosper in your hand and nothing will cut short your ministry and your effectiveness in Jesus' name. Remember, start immediately and reach out to people who need your preaching, your teaching, your counseling, your follow-up, your discipleship. The Lord be with you everywhere.